Alright folks, this is David Williams with Jesus Ministries and we're walking through the book of Acts. We're on chapter 9. We've gotten through the first half or much of the first part of the book and we're talking about a little bit after, today we're going to be talking about a little bit after the conversion, the salvation of Saul who, who was a Jewish Pharisee. He was a part of a, a certain group of Jewish priests and of course it was his job to be astute in the knowledge of the law and the prophetic books and certain of the other books that the rabbi, the Jewish teachers had written and handed down and so he was expert in much of that but because of that and a blindness to the spiritual realities that those books of Moses and the other prophets were revealing. He thought that all of the Christians were heretics and deserving death. And so he went about trying to execute them. And so en route to uh, the city of Damascus, which is in Syria, he went about to arrest and, and, and try through a court trial and kill some Christians. And they weren't called Christians at this point. But in route there, on a, on a road, he, he met Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ actually appeared to him in, in light form, spoke to him. And, and Saul's response was, Lord, what do you want me to do? He acknowledged Jesus. After Jesus made clear who he was, uh, Saul actually acknowledged who he was as Lord. He said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord gave him instructions. The Lord introduced Saul to another disciple named Ananias a few days after Saul was blinded by this great light of the light in the presence of God. And this disciple comes, lays hands on Saul. Saul can now see. Saul is converted to the Christian or to the faith of Jesus Christ because he can now understand the Old Testament writings for what they actually were, which was that they were leading people to accept and to embrace the Messiah and his truth, which was the truth that Moses was speaking about, of course. And as this is going on, Saul is baptized. He receives the, the, the Holy Spirit, and he's now preaching. And, of course, as he's doing this, the Jews who thought he was there to support their cause, they get jealous, and they want Saul dead They've got to transport Saul out of there quickly. And then he goes somewhere else and he's preaching there and they want him dead. And they've got to transport him out of there. And the Bible says that the church had rest because the persecution of the believers had died down greatly. And so we're going to catch up with Peter in verse 32 here. It says, and it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And that's a good definition for us, saints. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. So when it says kept his bed, it's saying he was paralyzed. He was bedridden. And he had a disease that would seize him, cause some type of seizure-like paralysis that prevented him, this guy Aeneas, from functioning. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, called him by name, okay, Jesus Christ makes you whole. He was declaring health to Aeneas' body by the authority of Jesus Christ. And so the modern day saint has that authority as long as he is, as long as God allots him the power and as long as the guy commits to the faith. And so he says, Jesus Christ makes you whole. Arise, make your bed. And he arose immediately. So this wasn't a laborious time of prayer for Aeneas. Peter was, was walking with God. The measure of grace he had on his life was to the degree that he could do things like this. He did it and there were immediate results. And that's what I believe that God wants for his people to be able to uh, obtain according to his will for their lives individually. But Peter was able to walk in this. This man was immediately healed. And verse 35 says, 
and all that dwelt at, at Lydda and Saren saw him and turned to the Lord. So salvation, mass salvation occurred as a direct result of this miracle. So that's a, a, a consistent theme that we see in the book of Acts, which is a depiction of God's church. What the first church and churches were like under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And our churches in our modern times should aspire to obtain this level of love for God and this level of, of, of faith because it, the Word of God describes the signs and the wonders and the miracles following those that believe. And so mass salvation occurred, it says, and many turned to the Lord. It says, and the, and the people of these cities turned to the Lord. Verse 36, now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha. This is a, a, a woman which by interpretation is called Dorcas. And so now we've got Tabitha, which is a Hebrew name. And then we've got Dorcas, which is a Latin based name. And so that was her name. It was Tabitha, depending on which culture you were a part of, it was Dorcas. And it says, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, meaning she would give to the poor, which she did. And it, came, and it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, meaning they physically washed her corpse, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was near to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent to him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. And then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows, these are the women that are not married because of their husbands' deaths, stood by him weeping and showing him the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out. Now we've got an interesting practice that we saw yeah, Jesus Christ do and we believe that Jesus is targeting unbelief when he did that and we believe Peter is targeting unbelief when he did that he put the weeping widows out sometimes when you've got the parent or the loved one of someone who's deceased or someone who's sick they need to be removed from the physical scene because their sadness may be a source of doubt and unbelief and so it's interesting that our emotions are not necessarily access to faith. You can be upset at someone's condition to the point of sympathy and feeling bad for them or just bad because of the situation. It doesn't necessarily mean that God responds to the grief per se. Not that he never does. But the reality is that's not the higher level of, of what it is that God wants us to try to tap into or to be given to or surrendered to in times of of that would seem to be hopeless God doesn't want us to be given to our emotions in times of hopelessness so Peter put them out of the room he put them out of the room and then it says he and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body said Tabitha arise he is commanding her by the authority of Jesus Christ to wake up and she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. That's a blessing. That's amazing. That's holy right there. So Peter brought about the resurrection of this woman, Tabitha. How? Because of the resurrected Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost in Peter. Christ in Peter, the hope of eternal glory and present glory. Verse 41, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the living God for that. Many believed in the Lord because of the supernatural that Peter was able to access. How? By faith in Jesus Christ and his word. And it came to pass that he waited many days in Joppa with one Simon, who was a tanner, which is a leather, a leather worker. That's one of the definitions for that word, a tanner, leather worker, or that class of people. So here we've got Acts chapter 9. We just did verses uh, 36 through 43. And, and God wants us to be able to walk in the level of faith 
that everything that his will for us is can be done. It's not that every single person in the body is going to walk in these, this level of the miraculous, but there's a level of the miraculous according to your call that you've got to live out, and doubt will prevent you from that. And we ought not judge ourselves by what we think that we should be able to do. We've got to judge ourselves by what God desires to do through us, and that's how we're going to survive. That's how we're going to prosper as the sons of God. He's pouring out His Spirit, brothers and sisters, on sons and daughters. So just be available to Him for that. This is David Williams with Jesus Ministries.